I run every day. I run 10 seconds more each day than I did the day before. Just recently, I hit 8 minutes, which isn't much time at all in the grand scheme of things, but which feels long to me. Ironically, I guess, this habit has made me think about death quite often. My father died of a sudden heart attack at the age of 60. In the weeks after, I began having psychosomatic tremors in my heart. I say psychosomatic, but I think the truth is that I had gas, that I needed to burp and couldn't, and that my mind simply transmuted this symptom into an imminent and unstoppable cardiac arrest. I went to the doctor at some point during this time, and he told me that while I was perfectly healthy, my father's premature heart failure would always haunt me. Running, then, feels like running from death, and each day now I think about my father and his heart. Still, there's more to it than that. Increasing my time by 10 seconds every day has been very helpful to me and has kept me motivated. The feeling of going a few steps farther is good, and I never feel like I'm doing too much. But still, there's something undeniably mortal about it. Right now, I run more every day. Every six days, I run an extra minute. But someday, I will think to myself that it's long enough. I imagine that will happen around the 20 minute mark. I'm not trying to become a marathon runner. And so, the simple act of increasing my time puts me closer to the end of something. Child prodigies don't get better forever. In fact, they tend to reach the height of their abilities fairly early in their lives. That's not true in all cases, of course. Magnus Carlsen was a chess prodigy and went on to become probably the greatest player to ever live. But most prodigies are not Magnus Carlsen. They get very good, very fast, and then they stay at that same high level for a long time. You can't just get better forever. There's no telling if even Magnus has hit his peak. I finally read The Bell Jar. I've taken up the habit of forcing myself through 20 or so pages of a book every day, and you'd be surprised by how much reading that is. Let me introduce myself. I'm Esther Greenwood, all-American, girl wonder scholarship student. I think I made her up inside my head. Me, a poet? Are you kidding? It's a great novel, I think, and there's one scene in it that really sticks with me. Esther, the protagonist of the book, is thinking about pregnancy, and she discusses a drug that doctors gave women at the time that made it so they couldn't remember the pain of giving birth. Esther says this is a very male drug to give women. It's utterly apathetic about the pain women experience as it exists in the moment, but it leaves them happy to have more children. It occurred to me, reading this, that it's a bit like life itself. I walked a few miles in the winter in Bucharest recently, and I hated it. I don't have a strong part of me that enjoys unpleasant experiences. It's why I didn't run for so long. And if there had been a cab that passed me by that day, I would have taken it. But there wasn't, and so I was cold and unhappy. When I stepped inside, though, I forgot about all that and was warm and life continued. It all left me wondering how quickly we can blot out the past and how much of life is based on that blotting. I used to hate the song Starry Starry Night by Don McLean. Now I understand What you tried to say to me how you suffered for your sanity. One of the first ideas I had for my YouTube channel was to talk about why I hated it. Van Gogh, it seemed to me, was more than his suicide. Not every painting Van Gogh made was in some way leading up to his taking his own life. He loved, he knew people, he painted to the best of his abilities, and McLean's belief that he now understood what Van Gogh was saying to him felt arrogant to me. I always preferred Jonathan Richmond's song, Vincent Van Gogh, about the colors in the paintings and about how happy they made him. Well, have you heard about the painter, Vincent Van Gogh, who loved color and he let it show? And in the museum, what have we here? The baddest painter since ancient Jan Vermeer. These days, after having read The Bell Jar, I think differently. The whole time you read the novel, you hope for Esther to have a happy ending. Maybe she can get through her depression and go back to school and see how gifted she is. But even thinking these things feels perverse. There is no happy ending for Esther, for her depression and suicidality, because Sylvia Plath published the book and then killed herself. Any happy ending we got would be tainted, and that's just how it is. 
Van Gogh committed suicide, and Don McLean looks at his paintings and recognizes that part of himself in Van Gogh, and who exactly am I to tell him he's wrong? My father was into exercise, just as I am now, I guess, though he only started later in life and only seemingly to quiet whatever intense anxieties lived inside of him. While I run, I sometimes imagine him in his final days, pedaling on his stationary bike. My father wrote an unfinished non-fiction book that I haven't read but always mean to, a memoir of his failed attempt to be a worker on Wall Street. I wonder if Sylvia Plath's death can be engraved on her novel for me, and Van Gogh's death can be engraved on his paintings for Don McLean, then where can I engrave my father's death? On the books of his I haven't read? On the pedaling of his bike? I have started getting mad at museums filled with old paintings of Jesus. I'm sure some smart historian type could take me through these museums and tell me about all the differences between the Jesus and find a lot of value in the artistry. But the last time I went to one of these places, the Bucharest National Collection, I just found myself looking for novelty. Look at the elongated Christ. Look at Christ without a face. Look at the Christ who looks like he has a really big penis. Look at the Christ who looks like he has a really big penis. These are the only four pictures I took. It's tragic, as far as I'm concerned. For many of the earlier pieces, the medieval ones, we don't even know the artists' names. You could say there's something beautiful in that, in the way these men served the Lord anonymously, showed their devotion, but I think it's terrible. To sublimate your identity through the endless death of your god, to devote the creative life of an entire era to one man's mangled body. You hardly ever see him come back to life. Just Jesus Christ the baby and Jesus Christ the soon-to-be corpse. It's morbid and it gets dull, and there's something almost depraved about it. I recently read H.P. Lovecraft's short story, The Color Out of Space. I've been reading a lot of basic stuff recently. Lord of the Flies and Lovecraft and of course the Bell Jar. Stuff that you're supposed to read when you're younger, but I always hated reading as a kid. The Color Out of Space is about a meteor that drops on a farm and ruins everything. The person living on the farm, Nathan Gardner, watches as his family goes mad and dies because of the strange rock from a different planet. We read the slow decay of his world, the goodness and fecundity ripped from his land. At some point down the line, the presence that destroyed this farm will destroy the entire world. It's just a matter of when. Looking at the first 20 pages of the story, I found myself asking the question we ask of every unfortunate hero trapped in a terrible place. Why doesn't Nathan Gardner just leave? What fixes him near this rock that he knows, on some level, will kill him? By the end of the story, Nathan says something to explain this, that the meteor compelled him to stay in some way. But in truth, no explanation was ever necessary. Asking why Nathan does not leave his plot of land is like asking why Esther from the Bell Jar doesn't simply stop being depressed. The answer to both of these is equally obvious. It's because it has to be that way. People can't just solve all of their problems, can't just get better. Even child prodigies usually plateau at some point. One thing I will say for all these paintings of Jesus Christ is that they make death feel alien. I imagine living during the bubonic plague and watching the people around you die because of a disease you can't understand. I imagine that kind of death is a daily occurrence, banal, natural in its own way. But to see the endless paintings of Jesus on the cross in this grotesque spectacle, it feels unnatural. It's so incomprehensible to think that God himself should die pitifully, die like us, that perhaps we can't help but depict him over and over again. He came to us from somewhere far away and was killed brutally and for no good reason, and through this he engraved all of us, all our deaths, with himself, his divine and strange essence. I'm led to believe that his project is yet incomplete, that one day he, like the colorless meteor of H.P. Lovecraft, will destroy the world, finish the job, and absorb every soul that has ever lived. My father loved the Rodgers and Hammerstein musical Carousel. I never saw it as a kid, but I have a distinct memory of sitting on a swing set while he pushed me and sang one of the show's most famous songs, My Boy Bill. My boy Bill, he'll be tall and as tough as a tree. Will Bill. I don't remember if I liked that or not, and I have no idea how I spent my whole childhood never watching one of my father's favorite musicals. 
I think maybe my mother hated it and refused to sit through it. I finally saw the film recently though, and if there's one thing I wish I could talk to my father about, it's Carousel. A grotesque and ugly and pitiful musical, I want to know why and how he loved it so much. The show is about this freak, Billy Bigelow. We meet Billy first in the afterlife, as he's telling an angel the story of his life, how he lived and died. Every night, girls would gather around, music would be playing, carousel would be going round and round, the whole midway would be packed with people, and I'd be standing up there. Billy was a horrible person, mean, stupid, dull. He slapped his wife in the face, he refused to take any kind of work after he lost his job as a carousel barker. He's only good at what he used to do. So now he just don't do anything. You know something else, Carrie? Last Monday, he hit her. Nettie, did you hit him back? Oh no! Well, I would've. He died trying to steal from someone at gunpoint, an attempt to get money for his not-yet-born daughter. The whole movie, Billy's life story, is all leading up to the last act. Dead people can apparently go back to Earth for one day to finish their incomplete business, and Billy wants to help his struggling, now adolescent daughter. But in the end, the lead-up is for nothing. Billy goes back and helps nobody, fails himself and his family. Please. No! Please, dear. No! He talks to her briefly, slaps her, and then doesn't talk to her again. We will never know the truth for sure, but from what I know of him, I suspect my father liked Carousel in an extremely direct and uncomplicated way. I think he probably saw Billy in his own struggle with depression and intense anger, and I think he probably found something beautiful in Billy's tearful admission at the end of the film, where he says he loved the wife he abused and demeaned. I loved you too. I loved you. I don't agree. I don't think what Billy says here means anything. I don't think his love, if you can call it that, matters at all, and I think his words are the words of every abuser. In a strange way, this hypothetical disagreement haunts me, and I would like to show my father he was wrong, though even if he was alive, I never could. Still, there's something brutally honest about Carousel that I can't help but appreciate. It's natural, I think, to have hope for the people we have lost, to fantasize about what they might be like if we got to see them again. Perhaps their death and resurrection would redeem them in the way that Jesus' death and resurrection redeemed the world. Carousel is unflinching in its depiction of Billy, though, refuses to believe that death will make us whole, refuses to have hope. The musical imagines a world where things don't get better, where we do not change or grow, but instead, like the horses on a carousel, come round and round and round and round, and return always to where we began. And it finds beauty in that, sees it as all right, sings happy songs about moving forward nonetheless. <laughs> Even though I know on some level that he didn't, I like to think my father loved the movie in the same way that I do. I used to think running on a treadmill seemed sad. Why hook yourself up to this strange machine? Why not just go outside, see the world? I felt that way until I used one, and now I'm worried that I'm addicted to it. I like letting my mind zone out. I like the feeling of nothing changing around me. I like knowing that the steps I've just run will be run again and again, going and coming back like Billy Bigelow and Sylvia Plath and Vincent Van Gogh and Jesus Christ and my father. Today, I ran 8 minutes and 50 seconds. Tomorrow, I will run 9 minutes. Six days later, I'll run 10. Two months later, I'll run 30. A year later, I will run for three hours. 10 years later, 33 hours and 30 minutes. 100 years later, 330 hours and 30 minutes. 200 years later, 1,000 hours. And on and on and on and on and on.